Um, morning, everybody. Um, yeah, the B word, um, something which is occupying a lot of uh, our time, and thankfully something which is getting increasing um, attention, um, particularly in Northern Ireland dimension. I think if we look back at the whole Brexit process um, from before the referendum through the first year of the post-referendum um, period, Northern Ireland didn't get too much of a, uh, an airing in the negotiations, in the discussion in London, in the London-led media debate as, as well. But as you're probably aware, it's very much on the agenda now because if the UK government wants to move to the second phase of negotiations, there needs to be sufficient progress, in inverted commas, um, on what we call phase one issues, and that includes progress on Northern Ireland Island. Um, those of you who have not been following your Twitter accounts and um, online this morning will, may not be aware that the European Parliament has just adopted a resolution this morning indicating that sufficient progress has not been made and therefore we're, the, um, there's less likelihood of the European Council agreeing to move to the second phase. Anyway, um, I've been asked to talk about Brexit in Northern Ireland. A um, number of things I want to do is talk a little bit about the process. What is actually going on here? because it is quite a complex process, it's multifaceted, and I want to just give you a sense of what I see as the complexity of Brexit. Second, I want to go through some of the issues on the negotiating table, um, what's being addressed, what needs to be addressed, um, and then start looking in particular at where we fit in. Where's Northern Ireland in all this? What are some of the challenges? What are some of the possible options? What's the context in terms of um, opportunity for arrangements specifically addressing the, the challenges we face here, being identified, being included in the outcome. Okay. I think I've got 45 minutes of the total session. I'll try and move through fairly quickly, but I'm happy to answer questions at any particular point in time. So if you've got one, let me know, because I think it's far better, as we all know from an educational perspective, if... Those in the audience are probably asking the questions and getting those answered rather than simply listening to whoever's speaking. Okay, um, I do like the image on the left there. When it first came up on the front page of The Economist, I thought, yet again, you've got a London-based uh, organisation not including Northern Ireland in the, in the um, pictorial representation of an issue. Um, but there we are, tucked under England's arm. And obviously, for many Remainers, that's very much a sense of where we are, that Northern Ireland is being taken out of the... EU because of essentially a vote in England. Um, interestingly, that was, a, that was something which was drawn before the referendum result. Okay. Um, I hope you can see this. This was a, a, a cartoon from Liberation, the French newspaper, um, on the 29th of March this year, which I thought summed up a lot um, what Article 50 and the negotiations are about. Um, it's a swimming pool, for those of you who can't see. There's Theresa May leaning over and forcing her baby into the swimming pool. And the baby's asking, um, is it deep, mummy? And mummy's saying, no idea. We've embarked on a process which is unprecedented, which no one's been through before, has many complications, many dimensions. Um, more dimensions are being unveiled almost on a sort of daily basis. Um, and that we, therefore, we should not underestimate the scale of the task that Brexit yeah, involves. Okay. First of all, Brexit. We're all focused on these negotiations that are taking place between the British government and the Commission Task Force led by Michel Barnier at the moment. They are about leaving the EU. Okay. And if we go back to what Theresa May said last after the referendum, Brexit means Brexit, it means leaving the European Union. And there are important negotiations there. But Brexit is about far more than just the process of leaving the EU. Um, it's also about establishing the post-Brexit relationship between the UK and the EU. What form will that take? What will that involve in trade terms? What will that involve in terms of cooperation? What will it involve in terms of um, institutional arrangements. What's, what does it evolve in terms of legal jurisdiction? Uh, lots of questions there. As third point, as we've seen recently, there's a clear sense that actually that might take some time to actually put in place. Therefore, you've got to have a transition 
transitional arrangement. Um, Theresa May is now talking about two years. Some people are talking about three, four, five years. Um, so that's got to be negotiated as well. So you negotiate your leave, you negotiate your future, you negotiate the bridging transition in between. Another dimension we have to think about is, well, if you're leaving the European Union, you're also leaving a whole series of relationships with other countries. That could be Ukraine, it could be Canada, it could be Japan, it could be the United States, it could be the Swiss. What's going to replace those in trade terms? What's going to replace those in terms of cooperation around possibly research about educational exchanges? Um, those have to be negotiated, those have to be established. Have you got the capacity to do so? Um, fourthly, you've then got the whole question of, well, what are you doing with... Sorry, fifthly. What are you doing with the powers which come back to the UK as a consequence of leaving the EU? Um, what's happening to the legislation? What legislation are you going to put in place? Hence, we had the idea of a Great Repeal Act, now the EU Withdrawal Bill. Okay, what do you put on the statute book? How do you manage that process? And there's a lot of work going on in, in, in Westminster on that. And then, what do you do with the devolves? What do you do with us? What do you do with the Scots, the Welsh? Particularly where there's policy areas which, certainly the Welsh and the Scots, think are rightly theirs, but are now being blocked or being held in London. Um, how are you going to arrange those powers? What does this mean for devolution? Um, and then also another dimension to that is how do you actually evolve, involve sorry, the devolved in the whole process? What voice is there for Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland in what the British government is doing? Okay, so Brexit is about more than just leaving. It's got all these other dimensions as well and we could spend a lot of time going through all, all of those. Okay, to understand what Brexit means or could mean, um, we possibly need to know what we're actually leaving. Now, to listen to some of the debates over the last year or so, you do wonder how many people know much about that organisation of which the United Kingdom has been a member since the 1973. Uh, for some people, it just seems all about trade. But I think if we go through the list, you'll realise it's far more than that. And so when you're talking about leaving, when you're talking about establishing a new relationship, you've got to address a, a multiplicity of issues many of which are simply not getting the airing they might uh, merit. Um, you've got the single market, so you're mo removing yourself from the free movement of goods, services, capital and people. You're removing yourself from the associated EU governance arrangements um, around, for example, environmental protection, consumer protection. Um, you're leaving a common competition regime about state aids, about cartels, about uh, abuse of dominant positions, the regulation of the market, you're removing yourself from that regulatory regime. You're removing yourself from EU citizenship. Um, now, the EU citizenship rights aren't huge, but there are a number of rights there which individuals have as a consequence of EU membership. Those are likely to, to go. You're also removing yourself from the customs union, which obviously Brexit is. Um, champion because they believe that's going to create greater space for um, the UK to develop its own trade agreements with, with other countries. But in order to be able to negotiate new trade agreements, you've got to extricate yourself from the existing ones. Um, and there's more than 45 preferential trade agreements, many of which involve multiple countries, with which the, e which the EU has and which the UK will be withdrawing. It's withdrawing itself from the common agricultural policy, the common fisheries policies. For many people, great, because that means you take back control of your own agricultural policy, your own fisheries policy. But what fisheries policy are we going to have? What agricultural policy are we going to put in place from the, first of, or from the 30th of March 2018, 2019? Who's doing any thinking about it? Um, who's thinking about the infrastructure you need to put in place? Um, police and judicial cooperation? Um, not particularly high profile much of the time, but it's there. Um, if the UK withdraws, uh, when the EU, UK withdraws from the EU, what's going to replace that? Is there a desire to replace it, or do we simply withdraw from it? And then you've got the common foreign security policy, the EU's attempt to try and coordinate foreign policies between states. The likes of Boris Johnson, I think he's quite happy to st stand back from that. But there's others who argue, well, the Br UK British voice will just be 
decre decreases a consequence. It won't necessarily have the presence on the world stage that it, that it might want. How do you go about um, developing um, a replacement policy to the common foreign security policy? Okay, so that touches on some of the issues which are there. It's, it's, there's multiple issues there which need to be addressed. Where are we? Well, we're beginning to pick up on some of them. Um, the UK government is engaging with some of them, but as you can probably see from the, 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 the cartoon there, there's a sense that it's possibly going round and round in circles. Um, part of the challenge that the whole process is faced with at the moment is there's still not a huge amount of clarity on the British government's position. Despite what Theresa May has said, there's still quite considerable divisions between, uh, within, the, within the Conservative Party, within the Cabinet, um, and consequently, a common uh, concern being voiced by the EU side is, well, what is it you actually want? It's very difficult to negotiate with a partner if you don't really know what their broad lines are. Um, one could argue, with some justification, is that we've not really moved much beyond Brexit means Brexit. Because, yes, the British government has said we're leaving the customs union, has leaving with, we are leaving the single market, but then again, there's still voices in the British government who are arguing for the UK to stay in the customs union and in the single market. Um, and that sense of disunity within the government is such that one cannot rule out a reversal in Theresa May's position um, over the coming months. Okay. As I say, for the EU side, that's difficult to negotiate. And also, if we think about what the government's been talking about, how many of those issues has it actually picked up on? Not a huge number. Okay. So, things are moving slowly forward, and I'll say a little bit more about the process in a minute. Um, the British line at the moment, according to Theresa May and her Lancaster House speech, and to a certain extent Florence speech recently, is she wants the UK to leave the customs union. That would allow the UK to conclude its own trade agreements with third countries. It would leave the single market and therefore would no longer have to uphold the free movement of, of people. Um, instead, what she's looking for is, quote, a comprehensive, bold and ambitious free trade area plus a strategic partnership. I challenge anybody to look through government papers and give me any clear sense as to what that, those actually mean. We're lacking the detail. Okay. And when you're in negotiations with a, a, an organisation such as the EU, you have to focus on the, on the detail. Okay. Um, what she's also said is that she wants to maintain the common travel area. Uh, I think if you talk to a lot of people in GB, they won't have a clue what you're talking about when you talk about the common travel area. But obviously for us here, that's important because it allows us to make, have free movement on the island and between these islands. Um, how she's going to do that, we're not too sure. The detail has not been spelt out. Um, and how you can reconcile that with being outside the customs union, being outside free movement of people, um, we're not too sure. She has said she wants to continue, see the UK continue to collaborate on major science, research and technology initiatives, which from university perspective is welcome news, from industrial perspective is often welcome news. But the detail of how she intends to do that, how much money she's willing to see the UK put into that, remains unclear. She's also talked about remaining in various forms of cooperation to fight against crime and terrorism. Beyond that, we haven't got a lot. Okay. A couple of red lines. If we go back to the white paper, which was produced earlier this year, it seems to be there are two. One is taking control of our own laws. We will take control of our own statute book and bring an end to the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice of the European Union in the UK. This seems to be, seems to be a fundamental red line, that the UK, in withdrawing from the EU, wants to remove any jurisdiction of the Court of justice. Um, slightly problematic because if you're in a relationship with the EU, there's legal arrangements in place, someone has to have jurisdiction over them. Okay. And you've probably picked up over the last couple of months, there's been a number of discussions as to how you might get around this particular issue. Um, secondly, we will not be seeking membership of the single market. The public have confidence in our ability to control, must have confidence in our ability to control immigration. It is simply not possible to control immigration overall when there is unlimited free movement of people to the UK from the EU. And that seems to be the second red line, that there's not going to be free movement of people from the EU into the UK. Okay. 
That obviously raises issues here when we have free movement of people on the island. Um, how can you reconcile that red line with maintaining an open border here? Uh, there's probably ways you can, but uh, beyond this, I'm not too sure what we see in terms of the actual ask from the British government. Um, and the fact that we're in a process of negotiations which will see the UK leave on, the, on midnight on the 29th of March 2019 means to say we've got very little time to sort it all out. So I want to say a little bit about that process. Okay. Focus at the moment is very much Article 50 negotiations. Um, this man, uh, I think before, nine months ago, no one knew who Michel Barnier was. I think we've all heard his name probably too often than is healthy for us. Uh, we're going to hear a lot more of it uh, in due course. Um, he's leading the Article 50 negotiations, which are characterised by a set of European Council guidelines which have been adopted. Um, there's been some mandates adopted by the EU. Um, we've now got the negotiations. Um, once negotiations have broadly concluded, you, you'll have that conclusion through a political agreement that will come. After that, the process has to see that agreement translated. Um, yeah, then have to have a signature um, ceremony. The European Parliament has to give its consent and there has to be UK ratification of the deal. I put all that down because all that's got to happen by the 20, midnight on the 29th of March 2019. If you want to have a timeline, oh, and we're not too sure how we're getting on at the moment, an American cartoon, um, or from The Economist, sorry. EU negotiations, EU fairly clear what it wants, and uh, the British not particularly well viewed here, still trying to cur um, come to terms with what's involved. All right, the process. I think this is important to highlight the fact there's a huge time pressure building up here. If the UK is to leave on the midnight on the 29th of March 2019, withdrawal from midnight then, you've got to have the EU27 deciding, this is working backwards, you've got to have the European Parliament deciding, you've got to have the UK Parliament voting, you've got to have a signature ceremony, you've got to have the conclusion negotiations, you need time for those negotiations to be put in writing, um, or the outcome of the people in writing, and translated. So effectively, what we're saying is if, you, if you're going to give yourself six months for that, which would be fairly normal, negotiations have to conclude in a year's time. A tall order, given how little progress we've actually made in those negotiations. The UK notified the EU that it wanted to leave on the 29th of March this year. Um, the European Council then adopted its negotiating guidelines on the 29th of April. Uh, 22nd of May, the Council got its negotiating mandate. This is mandating the Commission. I'll say more about that in a moment. And then negotiations started. We've had four rounds of negotiations. Um, there'll be another set in October. And then on the 19th, 20th of October, the European Council, the heads of government, EU27, will meet to decide whether sufficient progress has been made on what we call the first phase of negotiations in order to move to the second. Okay, at the moment, it's not looking too good for the British on that. If they don't agree then, they probably won't agree until December. And the time pressure just increases on the British government in order to um, complete the negotiations. If you don't complete negotiations in time, the UK simply leaves without an agreement. Unless everybody agrees to prolong the negotiations. Interestingly, no one's talking about prolonging the negotiations at the moment. Okay. So we run the risk of falling out of the EU. Okay. So, multifaceted process. A very complex, unprecedented process we have. All right, the more important stuff, us. Where do we feature in all this? Okay, um, prior to the referendum, a number of us were trying to promote discussion, along with others, on the issues as they might affect Northern Ireland. Um, we didn't make too much headway, because if we look back at the referendum campaign, we didn't have much of one here. We didn't really discuss issues very much at all. Since then, people have come to terms with the fact that actually it's pretty complex here, and there are some quite fundamental issues which will need to be addressed. Um, part of that comes from the context. Whether we like it or not, we are different in the Brexit process. 
One is because we have a land border. Um, we take it for granted. But I can tell you the number of times I've spoken to officials in London who have indicated that, yeah, we rather forgot there was a land border. The perception in London and Manchester is the UK's border is at Dover, Felixstowe, Manchester Airport. That it's really quite clear where it is and it can be controlled because you have exit points through ports and airports. They tend to forget we've got a 499 kilometre border here. So we're different in that respect. Secondly, we've obviously got the peace process um, and um, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement that we are a post-conflict society or we're a society going through a peace process. That doesn't apply in the, in the case of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and, and Scotland, Wales and, and England. Okay. Thirdly, we are obviously similar here to Scotland and, and Wales, we have devolution. Um, and de managing um, Brexit in the context of devolution requires awareness of the particularities of, of the devolution settlement and also the capacity of the devolved region to engage with the, with the process. And then I think for some people it's also important the nature of the vote we had here. The vote what did see 56% of people um, voting in favour of the United Kingdom remaining in the EU. I choose my words carefully. They voted in favour of the United Kingdom remaining in the EU. A number of people have indicated, well, it's not simply Northern Ireland staying in the EU. Because for some people, um, they only want Northern Ireland remaining in the EU as part of the United Kingdom. Other point to make out about this map, or the, this, the, the vote, is where the votes fell. You've obviously got Remain majorities along the border, which broadly allows us to map those onto, and in um, three parts of Belfast, to map that onto traditional divisions. Um, and the data does indicate overwhelming majority of nationalists voted to remain. Um, um, a large minority of unionists voted similarly, but the majority of unionists were voted to leave. Okay, that's a context um, for this process. Challenges, there are many. Um, I've got eight up here. Um, free movement. What happens to free movement in the context of Brexit? And what are the implications of that for the border in particular? Um, the free movement issue, certainly around free movement of people, is linked into the common travel area. We feel it far more readily than people in GB do. Free movement of goods. If you haven't got the free movement of goods, you're going to have to have border controls. Where are you going to put those border controls? Can you put those border controls on a border which, or on a land border, which simply has, is unmarked? And which, symbolically, um, its absence is seen by many people as being part and parcel of the peace process. You begin to reverse that border in terms of put the paraphernalia of border controls on it. The symbolic importance of that is considerable. Um, okay. You've also got, through EU membership, through the economic development on the island as a whole, a variety of sectors where we can generally refer to an all-island economy, um, particularly when you've got the cross-border supply chains, which if you've then got one part of the island inside the customs union, one side out, you disrupt those chains. What does that mean for economic activity? What does it mean for the all-island electricity market? which has been developed on the assumption that there's free movement of goods, services, capital, and people on the island. Um, how do you maintain that um, in a Brexit environment when the two parts of the island will be part of different legal, juris legal jurisdictions as far as the um, supply service is concerned? What does it mean for cross-border cooperation, some of which is funded by the EU? Um, what does it mean, not just in terms of funded cooperation, but the sort of level of interdependence which has been established in the border area? You look at the healthcare, um, which is gen genuinely cross-border. Outlook Elvin was only um, built on the assumption that those people from Donegal would be using it. Um, if you start putting border controls up, what does that mean for the provision of cross-border services, which have been developed according to economies of scale around the border? We don't know. What could the disruption be? Um, it also brings political uncertainty. Whether we'd like it or not, the question of a border poll is probably back more on the agenda now than it has been for the last 10 years. And that's because of Brexit, the vote. Okay. Um, 
And there's also a sense as well that while there has been broad agreement on essential principles for Brexit, Northern Ireland and Brexit, in the discussions within, between the political parties on re-establishing the executive, I think when we look at the more substantive positions the parties have, there are differences there. And I do wonder how easy it would be, if we do get an executive back, for that executive to really agree on what the Northern Ireland ask is in this process. Um, institutional capacity. Um, one could be cynical and say we didn't really trust our politicians to run this place when they had limited, limited powers, but hand on heart, do we really think we can develop a common fisheries policy and agricultural policy and all the various replacement policies in time for the 30th of March 2019 locally? I'm not too sure. We also see this is all happening at a time when the civil service has been cut back. So we don't actually have the institu institutional capacity locally to engage as much as we want. Question marks about the common travel area. Um, personally, I do think the common travel area will survive, but it's raising questions about what is the common travel area? Where is it written down? And people are realising it's a mix of law, custom, practice and assumption. Um, and some of that has actually been facilitated and developed as a consequence of EU membership as opposed to the fact that the common travel area in principle has existed for longer than the two parts of the island have been members of the European Union. I've already mentioned the peace process and the border poll. Okay, so lots of issues here. Um, and I think if you started looking at government positions, UK government positions, you'd struggle to find many references to these particular issues because they are issues for here. They're not issues for the UK as a whole. They're not issues for the UK government as a whole. At least they're not the headline issues for them. Um, but they are very real challenges here. Okay, now... I'd be quite critical of the British government in terms of its level of engagement on Northern Ireland issues, partly because that's a reflection of the fact that the British government's position is underdeveloped, at least its public position is underdeveloped. Um, I would say, however, if we look at the other side of the negotiating table, the EU27, there's an argument to say that we have a more sympathetic ear there, publicly at least, than we might do with London. Um, now, that's not to say that privately London is very much aware of all the issues here, but publicly um, there's a very sympathetic ear coming, a very sympathetic, sympathetic ear in evidence um, as far as the EU27 is concerned. So I bring your attention to these European Council guidelines. The European Council adopted guidelines for negotiations. In order for the Commission, Michel Barnier, to negotiate, he has to have a framework for negotiations, and that framework has been developed through two documents. First of which is the European Council Guidelines. And these in paragraph 11, um, so sad I am, I know the exact paragraph it is. Um, I've read it too many times and it's healthy, healthy for me. Has a particular reference to here. Um, it's worth reading it in full. The Union, so the EU, has consistently supported the goal of peace and reconciliation enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts and continuing to support and protect the achievements, benefits and commitments of the peace process will remain of paramount importance. In view of the unique circumstances on the island of Ireland, flexible and imaginative solutions will be required, including with the aim of avoiding a hard border while respecting the integrity of the Union's legal order. In this context, the Union should also recognise existing bilateral agreements and arrangements between the United Kingdom and Ireland which are compatible with EU law. The bit I've underlined is flexible and imaginative solutions. That there is a willingness, at least rhetorically, on the part of the EU to say, look, Northern Ireland, this island, is different in the context of Brexit, partly because of the land border, partly because of the peace process, such that we possibly need to be a bit more flexible, a bit more imaginative in how we manage Brexit. Okay. This has obviously led to certain political parties arguing for special status. It's certainly led to all parts, political parties here recognising there are unique, we are unique in this context. Um, my mind, to my mind, this opens up space for doing things slightly more differently here as, as far as Brexit is concerned uh, compared to the rest of the UK. That's commitment to treating this place not really, well, partly differently, but certainly giving it a higher profile, is reflected in the terms of reference for the Article 50 negotiations. Okay, I mentioned earlier there's two phases, phase one, phase two. 
Phase two is essentially thinking about the future relationship. Phase one is about sorting out the divorce or the withdrawal. As part of that process, you've got to sort out um, citizens' rights, the financial settlement, um, and there's various other separation issues. But highlighted here, it states quite clearly that in addition, a dialogue on Ireland, Northern Ireland, has been launched under the authority of the coordinators. In other words, addressing the particular issues as they of Brexit as they affect this island is a concern of the EU27. They want to have talks on that. They're not formal negotiations, they're a dialogue to try and ensure that um, flexible and imaginative solutions might be found um, to address some of the challenges that Brexit poses for Northern Ireland. Okay. And this is a dialogue in which the British government are willingly engaging. Okay. Um, the argument that there's a sympathetic ear there is highlighted also in the fact that the Council, um, European Council is the EU leaders, the Council is the ministers, came together to expand on article, on paragraph 11 of the European Council guidelines, and they um, took much of the wording, but then also expanded it to say that flexible imaginative solutions need to also think about not just the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts, but also its related implementing agreements. So we're talking about St Andrews, uh, for example. Um, it also then talk, goes further in saying full account should be taken um, of the fact that Irish citizens residing in Northern Ireland will continue to enjoy rights as EU citizens. Um, so really highlighting that particular issue. Um, and then also reflecting the fact that for Ireland in particular, um, Brexit poses big challenges trade-wise because so much of Irish exports, and including a significant number of exports from here beyond the UK, go through GB. There's the whole question of transit and transiting goods through the UK. That needs to be addressed. So within the negotiations, we've got a profile which Scotland simply doesn't have, that Wales simply doesn't have, that no particular sectors have. Um, we've got a privileged position. That doesn't mean saying that anything will necessarily come of it, but the fact is, we're high up on the agenda. All right. The British government has contributed to this process with a position paper in August, um, which did not get the most favourable of welcomes in the media, shall we say. Um, I'd like to say there's a number of things that are really positive about it. Firstly, if we think back to the referendum campaign, we think back to the aftermath of the referendum, lots of people around saying, common trial, ah, don't worry about it. It predates EU membership. Okay, but yeah, then again, EU membership, we're both in the same legal regime. We're now going into two separate directions. They're saying, ah, don't worry about a border. There won't be a hard border. We're not returning to the borders of the past. Um, they also argued, well, you don't need to worry about the Good Friday Agreement at all. That's Belfast Agreement, that's fine. That's, that, that's nothing to do with the EU. It's only, EU's only mentioned in it seven times. Um, a lot of us are arguing, we'll say, OK, that may be the case, but context matters. One of the reasons why the Good Friday Agreement is often associated with free movement of goods, service, capital and people is not because that's what the Good Friday Agreement provided for. That's what EU membership provided for, which ran alongside the Good Friday Agreement. If you take EU membership out, what happens? We don't know. My point is that if you go back to the British government paper in the summer, it was it flagged these as issues. It was effectively saying, look, there's four big issues that we've got to engage with here. One is how do we uphold Belfast's Good Friday Agreement in all its parts? So not just what it's achieved, but what could come further down the line. So it wanted to engage on that. It, it accepted that there was an issue there to be addressed. It accepted that, yeah, the common travel area does predate membership, but doesn't necessarily mean to say it will survive member, uh, the UK with, withdrawing. So we have to think about that. We have to think about how you avoid a hard, hard border. Because how do you avoid a hard border if the, if the essential line of the British government is you've got to have um, full control over your borders if you're outside the customs union. There has to be customs control somewhere. So how are you going to do it? Um, and then there's also a recognition that you've actually got some really useful north, south and east-west cooperation which is taking place which may not be possible to continue if you have a hard Brexit. 
So the British government put these issues on the table and said, okay, we've got to sit down and talk to these. So that's the positive side. Um, less positive is the ideas it came up with. Um, it talked about an EU customs partnership, um, rather underdeveloped. Um, but the idea was, I think, that the, the EU would trust the UK to um, deal with EU customs on it, the UK's external borders, um, such that movement goods could continue to move freely. Um, that requires a very high level of trust, which simply does not exist. It came up with the idea of creating customs exemptions for smaller traders. Um, the definition was anybody less than uh, any organisation with less than 250 employees. Um, the argument there was that if you were such a company, you would be able to trade across the Irish border freely without any customs control. Okay, now, not too sure how that's going to work because if you're outside the customs union, you are outside the customs union. That becomes an international trade border. Um, but the idea was put, up, put on, 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 on the table. Um, it's going to also said that it wanted to continue some peace funding and also wanted, in terms of flexible and imaginative solutions, to continue the operation of the single electricity market. But essentially that was it. So if you go back to the previous slide identifying some of the challenges, it's tip of the iceberg stuff. This was initially, the paper was initially presented as the UK government position paper on Northern Ireland and Ireland. It subsequently became a position paper. So the expectation is that other position papers are going to come. Partly because the EU's response was, look, I'm sorry, go away and do your homework. This isn't going to guarantee the full implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. You've got to come up with some ideas. So there's some bit more homework being done by British officials at the moment. OK, um, where are we since then? The response of the EU was, at least according to the media and The Guardian, that it was thinking about magical thinking over a Brexit plan for the Irish border. It wasn't really accepted as a viable solution. And I think David Davis is also on record as saying, well, it was a bit of blue sky thinking. Well, sorry, we need more than blue sky thinking at this stage in the negotiations. Um, we then had the Commission issuing its set of its guiding principles um, for the dialogue on Ireland and Northern Ireland, and that really places the focus on common travel area at the moment and the future of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, less so on the future trade agreement because that's going to be part of the second phase of negotiations, and that's where you're going to have to think about the, the border. But what, interestingly, what the Commission has said is that the onus has to be on the UK to come up with ideas. Um, there's that space for flexible and imaginative solutions, but the onus of the proposed solutions, um, which overcome the challenges created on the island of Ireland by the UK's withdrawal, um, essentially has to be with the UK. The fact that the EU is saying that obviously means to say that it's still open to finding something flexible um, and imaginative for here. Question is, what might those flexible and imaginative solutions be? Some ideas. <coughs> Could, I stress could, Northern Ireland, if the UK withdraws from the European economic area, remain part of it? Could you have the free movement of goods, services, capital and people operating on this island? Don't know. But if you're trying to maintain the status quo, which is essentially the position of the political parties, it's possibly worth looking at. Could you, in order to support... Um, as much the status quo as possible. Um, could you envisage the island of Ireland participating in EU programmes? But okay, the UK is withdrawing from the structural funds. Could you have an arrangement whereby programmes, projects on the island of Ireland could receive EU funding? Don't know. But it's something different. Agriculture, one of my biggest bugbears in this whole process is that everybody seems to assume that if you are in the customs union, if you are in the single market, you have free trade in agricultural goods. You don't. There is no non-member state of the European Union who has, agriculture, has free trade in agricultural goods with the EU. So if the UK, or when the UK leaves the EU, it will leave free trade in agricultural goods with the rest of the, the EU. Now, 
for some of the big farmers in Britain, it doesn't really matter. But for farmers here, particularly in the border areas, that could prove catastrophic. So can you, it's a question, can you envisage a situation where if the UK doesn't get free trade in agricultural goods with the EU, that you possibly allow free trade in agricultural goods on the island? Possibly some, just in some sectors. I don't know. But if we're thinking about flexible and imaginative solutions which try and minimise the disruption of Brexit for Northern Ireland, might that be one that you consider? Um, police and security cooperation. Um, David Ford was in here earlier. About three years ago, the UK decided it was going to opt out of a lot of EU legislation, EU cooperation on justice and home affairs cooperation. Um, one of the reasons why it didn't opt out as much as it, it um, intended to was because of concerns here about how North-South police and judicial cooperation might continue to function. And David Ford was quite instrumental in getting, interestingly, James Brokenshire and Theresa May to stay in more of it. If the UK leaves, it's an if, if the UK leaves the European arrest warrant, could you allow the European arrest warrant to continue to function on the island? I don't know. But it's something which I th certainly I think some of the um, forces, the PSNI is concerned about here. If you don't have it, um, how can you proceed with extradition issues? Um, could you have some regulatory frames or bodies using the electricity market, for example, which are all island? Um, could you use the Good Friday Agreement, and Strand 2, the North-South Cooperation, to address some of the regulatory policy challenges around the environment, for example? Okay. In other words, is there scope within a f effectively functioning Belfast Good Friday Agreement to use some of the structures there to address some of the challenges which are being identified. How are we going to regulate fisheries? Not too sure about that. Um, I'm not too sure anybody's told the farmers, uh, the fishermen in Kilkeel that basically come Brexit day, you come out of Kilkeel Harbour, you are not sailing south. Because that will be an international border then. Um, I don't know. We've got to be thinking about this. It may be you can do it within the context of the UK-EU relationship. If the UK goes for a fairly soft Brexit, the number of issues, particular challenges for Northern Ireland and Ireland decreases. But if it is the hard Brexit, which most people are anticipating now, there's lots of issues there which we need to be thinking about. My argument is that there's scope within the context of the negotiations, the language which is around, for us to be thinking quite creatively about how you might pragmatically address some of those challenges so that um, those, the challenges um, it, are reduced in the context of, of, of Brexit for, for Northern Ireland and the island as a whole. Okay. As you probably appreciate, I can talk for hours on this. <laughs> but um, I see people have kept writing and that. Those are some, some of the ideas we've got. Hopefully that's given you a sense of where we are with the process. Um, given us a sense of what some of the challenges are, it's far from exhaustive. But um, as I say, hopefully that's been of use to you and I'm happy to take any questions that anybody might have. Thank you.